Now at Mickey D's, when you buy any crispy chicken sandwich or quarter pounder with cheese, you'll get a free medium fry and free medium drink when you order on the app. So do you have the app? How are you going to get this deal if you don't have the app? I know you have a phone. Anywho, if you have the app, enjoy your free fries and drink. If you don't, you can't see me. But know that I'm shaking my head. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Limited time only. I participate in McDonald's. Valid one time per day. Visit McDonald's app for details. Download and registration required. I'm Rose, Enes at Innova. For the past seven years, Innova has been the backbone to my success. At Innova, we are for nurses like Rose. We provide support nurses deserve both in and out of the workplace. From tuition assistance to support from colleagues and leaders and the experience I've gained throughout my career, Innova has been the perfect place for me. At Innova, our nurses are valued, heard, and empowered. We are for you. Visit Anova.org slash join. Welcome to Destiny. Now here's your host, Cliff Dunning. Well, hello. How are you there? I uh, was looking at the calendar. We're beyond the halfway point of 2022. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, we're coming up on a midterm election here in the United States. And and most people are focusing on the various uh, Senate and uh, congressional races uh, to learn who will be the dominant party uh, for the remainder of the year into 2023 and beyond. But there's also a lot of important topics on many ballots throughout the country. One of the big ones is legalization of cannabis. And if you know, if you've been listening to Destiny... Uh, I'm a big advocate. I'm an author of uh, Cannabis and Sexual Ecstasy for Men, came out recently. And as I've been interviewing on other programs and uh, podcasts, it's come to my attention that there are a number of states that are uh, about to uh, actually ratify and legalize the use of cannabis, marijuana, pot, weed, whatever you want to call it. This is a really good thing because... Uh, As I've mentioned many times before, we don't know enough about the healing benefits of cannabis. We don't know enough about its uh, uh, positive attributes. A lot of people are fearful of cannabis as a uh, what they call a gateway drug that leads to people using uh, heroin or strong and uh, toxic uh, drugs that can be easily abused and, and are highly addictive. I don't go there simply because it's uh, everybody's different. But the point I'm trying to make is there is 16 states that are about to offer their residents a chance to vote on legalization of recreational use. Now, a lot of the country, a lot of the states uh, in the United States are allow for medical use of, of uh, marijuana. And uh, this is something that you you have to uh, work with your doctor. You have to get a card. It's a different kind of uh, cannabis. And we're going to have some physicians on later in the year to talk about what the difference is about medical marijuana uh, versus uh, recreational. Most of the time, the medical marijuana is used for pain management, for degenerative conditions, for MS, A lot of neurological conditions uh, really benefit from uh, from cannabis. And the dosage, or I should say the THC levels, tend to be much higher. When it comes to recreational cannabis, the focus is not on so much of the strength of the THC, but the quality of its uh, manufacture, how it's grown. And and so we're going to follow closely what the reactions are. Because, hey, if you're in a state that's illegal, that just makes life hell. And, you know, we talk about cannabis uh, uh, tourism where you 
go to uh, another state that's legal and have a weekend of uh, exploration. Uh, this is big in Europe. It's big here in, Ca in California. People fly from Nevada, from the... De I, have, I know people that have flown from the De uh, North Co uh, Dakota and other states just to be able to sample legal cannabis. So it's really big news. My goal is to see the entire United States legalize. So not only can people use and benefit from ex experiencing cannabis, but it'll open the door for university study, uh, scientific study of the benefits of, of uh, cannabis, its effect on body, mind, and spirit. <laughs> That's not so much science there, but other researchers are looking into it spiritually. And it's a really amazing on many, many levels, and you've heard it here, just what cannabis can bring to the table on so many different fronts. And, you know, uh, again, to make it recreational is what we're looking at. Education is huge, and uh, we need to have more research done on the benefits, the properties within cannabis. It's only been the last five to seven years that cannabinoids have been studied. Endocannabinoids are in our body, and uh, the major compounds uh, are critical to understand. The Europeans have been studying them a little bit longer, but there's a lot of problems uh, and legal issues in Europe. When we begin to uh, really drill down and understand the benefits of these amazing compounds, we're going to see that we're talking about a miracle drug. And we're going to have a tremendous amount of insight into this wonderful plant medicine that in many cases is a, a lifesaver for people with chronic illness. But uh, we also want to look at it from the beneficial side of getting altered and and working with our mind, body, and spirit to you know open us to more act to access more data to work with uh, our our higher wisdom, the different levels of personality, uh, in a creative way, in a healing way, in a discovery manner. This is one of the big things about psychedelics that people really like: ayahuasca, LSD, DMT. It's the exploration aspects. Well. You don't have to go to that extreme. And we've had people on this program talking about using cannabis in microdose levels so you're slightly altered. So you're beginning to see in a different, with different eyes, with different sensations. And this is the, really the beauty of using cannabis. A new book just was released a few months ago. It's called The Brain on Cannabis by Dr. Rebecca Siegel. We're going to have Dr. Siegel on a program in September, but this book is, is wonderful on a lot of levels. Most notably, she is a practicing psychiatrist who is also an advocate for cannabis, and she is one of a growing number of physicians not only advocating the use of cannabis, but teaching people how to use it and the various areas uh, of illness, of chronic pain, disease, where applying cannabis can really be a benefit. So this is a uh, short audio of Dr. Siegel talking about her experience with uh, cannabis. Let's have a quick listen. When, so you said uh, about four years ago, you started being introduced to cannabis. When did you become a believer in cannabis and, and a believer in it even being a part of a medical conversation? Definitely when my patient came to me and said this had cured her insomnia, she found the cure for her, right? And that's why I always say, you know, cannabis is not a one size fits all. It can be very helpful for some, and, but I have also seen as a medical practitioner how it may not be helpful for others, which right. I think you talk about also in your journey with cannabis, right? Where it had been helpful and then it stopped being and you had to figure it out and, you know, do different kinds of balances of THC and CBD and the, you know, all the, the terpenes and everything like that. Um, people don't get that, right? But so, you know, I see it as my kind of role to, if people want me to, I can't make people come to me 
with then you know to give them the knowledge that I have. But right. it, it definitely helped her. And I said, wow, how do I get involved with this field? And so I'm in New York, you know, and I'm in New York City. And I went and looked. I knew it was medically legal, right? So that was a huge thing that I should learn. But that I didn't know anything about it, how to practice it, how to certify for it. Was I just going to write a prescription? I didn't know. But all you kind of needed to do at that point was you had to have an active medical license, a DEA license, and you had to take a course. It was a four-hour course online teaching me about the basics of cannabis, which you know I did in, I think, an hour, right? Because I was, I was excited. I wanted to learn. <laughs> and, that, and that course didn't even include a discussion about the endocannabinoid system, did it? It taught me nothing. I mean, it taught me the beginnings, but I knew I needed to learn more if I was going to help people. And so that I actually then wanted to, I, I found a medical cannabis conference at UCLA, which that was in 2018. And I went to that that conference and I saw, um, you know, Dr. Mishulam and I saw all these sort of the really big researchers in medical cannabis. And they, it, it just in, increased and spiked my interest. And I became a definite believer in there were things that it could be so incredibly helpful for. And then as I put myself out there in that space, I had patients coming to me who, you know, definitely asked for my help and how, you know, MS, um, certainly chronic pain and PTSD. And I treated many vets, you know, well, whether military vets or whether vets of, you know, September 11, all kinds of PTSD, you know, issues, um, a can, a cancer, chemo treatments. I've, I have seen a whole range and spectrum of how it can be helpful for people. But with the caveat, I have also seen how it might not be so helpful for some. Again, Dr. Siegel will be my guest in September, and we're going to drill down into this wonderful book, The Brain on Cannabis, in detail and really get a sense of what was her approach and what are the benefits that she say, sees as a practitioner of cannabis. All right. Our program today is with Dr. Pepper Hernandez, and we also have uh, Stephen Gray to to explain to us what they believe are the next phases in cannabis use, cannabis benefits, and and really the theme is moving beyond couch lock, moving beyond just getting high and walking around stoned and not using the tools, the benefits that come with the uh, use of cannabis. And so this is the next phase that I want to see. And I'm hoping that more people begin realizing that it's not just to get high. We've heard from Grant Hancock. We've heard from Dennis McKenna. We've heard from many experts on working with plant medicines. And so to our program today focuses on the next phase of cannabis use. Hello, this is Hey Dude Shoes. This is an ad, but not for your ears, for your feet. Are they listening? Good. Hey Dude Shoes are the squishiest, airiest, lightest go-to shoes you'll ever have the pleasure of introducing your toes to. So light, a butterfly could steal them. So soft, kittens seethe with jealousy. So cushy, your hands will curse your feet for all the love and attention. Toes, you've hit the jackpot of comfy. Hey Dude, good to go to. I'm Rose, Enes at Innova. For the past seven years, Innova has been the backbone to my success. At Innova, we are for nurses like Rose. We provide support nurses deserve both in and out of the workplace. From tuition assistance to support from colleagues and leaders and the experience I've gained throughout my career, Innova has been the perfect place for me. At Innova, our nurses are valued, heard, and empowered. We are for you. Visit innova.org slash join. Dramatic pause. A dramatic pause says something without saying anything at all. Dramatic pause is a go-to for podcasters, presidents, and radio voiceovers. It makes you look really smart, even if you're not. Feet deserve a go-to like that. Like Hey Do Shoes. Light, comfy, good to go to. 
time it's a little beyond mid-year and i've been thinking about cannabis we haven't talked about it enough on destiny uh in the last few months it's com- coming and going but we have major legislation here in the united states uh in november i think it's up to 16 different states are voting to make cannabis recreational that goes beyond medical medical means that you have to have a card you have have, have to have an issue Recreational, obviously, is uh, going into a dispensary and uh, easily purchasing uh, your cannabis and your paraphernalia. So this is a big deal for the United States. We're hoping federally that they legalize it uh, across the United States, which would make so much uh, make it so much easier for people who are growers, farmers, dispensary owners, and the industry as a whole. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, President Biden did mention a few weeks ago that he is looking into, I think there's a mandate for people who are still incarcerated to re- allow them to be freed and to have their records expunged of data regarding uh, small amounts and smoking uh, cannabis. So, But today we want to talk about a number of issues. The most important for me is the the way people a, a way uh, the way a population in the United States and, f- and probably in Europe looks at cannabis as a a way to get stoned the way a way to uh, blank out or you know you get w- w- what they call couch lock where you don't really think about anything else but else but getting wasted and uh, today I have two guests with me who are going to present their points of view. First, I want to uh, introduce Stephen Gray. Stephen's been with us before. He is the author of the excellent book, Cannabis and Spirituality, but he's also written other books, uh, Sacred World, a Spiritual Toolkit uh, for the Emerging Reality. He's a teacher, a writer, and he is coming to us from Vancouver, Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, Stephen, good to see you again. Hi, Cliff. And my other guest is Dr. Pepper Hernandez. I don't really need to uh, uh, introduce her other than to say that she is the founder and CEO of Cannabis Holistic Institute in Humboldt. She also launched Humboldt Holistic Foundation. She's a writer and a speaker. And she spends part of the year in her home state of Oklahoma. And we have been learning a great deal about Oklahoma, which is becoming quite a uh, epicenter for not only amazing growth and farming of cannabis, but also a lot of other uh, cannabis-related uh, issues. So, hey, Pepper, mm. great to have you with the program. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Stephen, I want to start with you. I, I introduced kind of the tip of the iceberg when it comes to cannabis and its use. Obviously, you're, you're in Canada, but what do you feel... Uh, what What is your sense when we see High Times Magazine promoting these uh, high THC flower concentrate dabs that that are so strong, that are so overwhelming that all you can do is just sit and live through the the actual uh, experience? Mm-hmm. Um, how How do I feel about that kind of approach? Yeah. yeah, well, it's it's marketing for one thing, you know. Um, and in fact, you're right, I think, as far as I can tell. I mean, I haven't done a scientific uh, research you know study of it, but it seems to me, well, actually, let, uh, let me go at it this way. Um, uh, if you want, we can talk about how cannabis was legalization was rolled out in Canada, which had its problems. Yeah. but that can come later if you want. Sure. Uh, so uh, and because of that, I haven't been buying from the legal stores although there's loads of them in Vancouver here. Um, I, I mostly either am gifted cannabis or um, I buy some kinds of specialty products from a guy who's a, like a completely geeky grower and you, know, you can talk your ear off for an hour about his methods and how pure and clean they are and so on and so on. Um, uh, 
you know, like he makes these really beautiful hash oils and stuff like that. But he also um, sells a lot of flour. And he says what everyone seems to want is the heavy-duty uh, indica types that put them in co- uh, coach lock mode. So, so that's uh, that's what a lot of people want. Um, so, mm. yeah, I mean, it's, you know, as you've already indicated, Cliff, that's not really what uh, we're talking about when we talk about cannabis, cannabis as a spiritual ally. You know, and that's more like um, alcohol. You know, yeah. using it to um, uh, numb yourself or blitz out or escape or whatever. You know, um, I'll you know not to ramble too long. Uh, I'm sure uh, Pepper has an answer to this as well uh, or comments. But um, in the cannabis book, oh, and by the way, I'm not. Uh, I'm I'm only partially the author. I'm the editor, and there's 17 other contributors of the book. And um, also, I don't want to, you know, go off into a tangent, but I have another book coming out in the fall, which you know about as well, which is... Yeah, we'll we'll have you definitely for that in November. I saw that. Yeah, that's another collaboration with other uh, uh, authors. 25 contributors, yeah. Yeah. It's called How Psychedelics Can Help Save the World. (laughs) Kind of a (laughs) bold proclamation, but nonetheless... um, uh, so, oh shit! Now where was I? Um, uh, I, I forgot what I was going to say now about that. Um, uh, Couch lock and and how this is kind of the norm of uh, your friends uh, creating cannabis that has high levels of THC. Right. I was going to reference Cat Harrison's chapter in the cannabis book, and she has a page or two in her wonderful chapter. It's actually my favorite chapter in the book, mm-hmm. uh, where she talks about how um, a lot of people, and she says in her experience, particularly young males, tend to go into their cave, like both literally and figuratively speaking, and um, and not want to come out into what she called the, in that chapter the daylight world of responsibility and relationship. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's a problem for a lot of people. So, you know, before I pass the torch here, um, uh, uh, I'd like to say that uh, the way I think of cannabis is, uh, like other psychedelics, a nonspecific or unspecific amplifier. Uh, I think of her as an extremely gracious kind of uh, ally, like, here, you can use me for amazing things, but, hey, if you want to escape and numb yourself out and kind of screw up your life, go right ahead. I'm not going to stop you. I'll just amplify that, too. Yeah, I love that yeah. word uh, amplify because it's yeah. true. It amplifies and enhances your consciousness. Pepper, you have been uh, visiting farms in uh, Oklahoma as well as here in California. What do you see growers? Are growers uh, uh, still looking to enhance their crops with the high THC or is it more quality product? I would like to say that the farms that we're targeting, that we're going to get content for the Cannabis Holistic Institute are hand chosen. So we're going to craft cannabis farms who are using organic, who are strain specific, who are focused on growing for the community. So that's what I'm seeing. But if you were to look at the overall in those states, I would say they're growing for high THC content for the consumer because that's what the consumer is asking for because the knowledge is not quite there yet of what to actually be looking for on the medical end. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so the guys that are growing the high THC, that could be for the two levels. You got the couch lock crews who just want to bliss out. And then High THC would also be good for people who need it for medical reasons, pain management, uh, I guess, arthritis. What else? We have a number of reasons why someone would want to grow high THC. From the farmer's end, it's because that's what's being purchased, right? That's what people in and around the country, whether it's on the legacy end or the white market end, that's what they're looking for. Why are they looking for that? Because most people have been much like greenwashed. They have been told that THC is what cannabis is all about until the education piece comes in and says, no, 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 THC isn't the only thing. That would be the entourage effect, right? That there are other cannabinoids that actually make your experience exactly the way that you want it. So those people who are searching out THC 
one are, I believe, just fully uneducated. Two, they may be chronic users of cannabis. Mm -hmm. And so their cultivars that they're choosing to look for are going to be those ones very high THC because they're um, a cannabis connoisseur, if you will. They have been using cannabis for such a long time that only cultivars with high THC content will actually work for them. For the new consumer or the new client or the new cannabis patient coming online, you should not be looking for high THC content cannabis. And and I agree. We also have to deal with the hip hop culture and uh, uh, other groups that are using and endorsing cannabis as a way just to get plastered you know mm-hmm. and i think that's a huge problem when you watch a music video and someone's got a big uh uh a, a reefer and they are uh enjoying it and all of a sudden they're on the couch and they can't get out of the couch obviously they have couch block <laughs> it's kind of like black and white but when you have that in the face of the, the up and coming generations it really makes it difficult for that for them to understand the spiritual nature of this uh, plant medicine, the the uh, other benefits, and more specifically, uh, Stephen, these new genetic strains are fabulous. They they've dialed them in and made them so they focus on creativity. Uh, you can work with uh, wellness issues, uh, but there's so many specific areas that are uh, now available to people to really, as you call it, amplify. So, qu- yeah. So what my question, question oh, yeah, my <laughs> question to you is in the face of all these new uh, genetic strains, how does the industry need to break out of this? Uh, let's just get high and, and, and pass mm-hmm. out on the couch. Well, I don't know that the industry will, actually. I think it's education of the kind of thing we're doing right here today, in my view. Um, Do you mind if I actually make a couple of quick comments about things that were part of the previous discussion with Pepper? Um, Oh, this is open, buddy. Go ahead. Okay, sure. So uh, (laughs) one thing, and Pepper, you may know more about this than me because you're a um, a naturopathic doctor and focus in this area and so on. Uh, But one thing I wanted to mention is as far as I know, with my moderately limited knowledge, uh, the terpenes have a lot to do with the effect as well, not just the other cannabinoids. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, you know, I've read a bunch about the terpenes like myrcene or myrcene, for example, is contributive uh, to or ch- couch lock or, you know, uh, soporific, I think they call it, etc. Mm-hmm. Some of the others are more up, uh, up oriented or more, you know, cerebrally oriented, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so that's one thing. And I also wanted to just add a little bit of evidence to the uh, focus on these uh, extremely potent uh, plants. Um, I heard about something. I get newsletters from various organizations, and uh, this one was called uh, Green Flower or something. I forget which one it was. Anyway, they mentioned something called a caviar cone. Um, uh, in Canada, it's produced by a company called Top Leaf. Uh, and I thought, well, that sounds kind of interesting. What it is, it's an infused joint, pre-rolled joint, right? Um, uh, it's it's um, it's got uh, it's dusted with hash, you know, like dusty hash sort of thing, <laughs> and it's got hash oil, kind of, you know, all into the flower, and it's two different <laughs> flowers. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so I thought, well, I'll just kind of try it out, you know. Oh, and so I I bought one. Oh, and I also read that seven of the top 10 selling products in California, cannabis products, are these infused pre-roll joints, right? Yeah. They're re- extremely strong. Um, I, I'm a cheap date. I, you know, I only smoke, you know, kind of to meditate or play music. And, uh, <laughs> okay, good. Um, and, you know, like twice a week or once a week, you know, I'm, I'm not a daily smoker. And so, you know, I'm, my endocannabinoid system is, you know, re- re- rough and ready to go, you know. Um, so uh, I had one toke of this thing and I thought, no, I, I don't like that and I don't need it. It was really, really strong. It, I didn't need it. What did it, it make you, know? you feel like? Did you, 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 was it like overwhelmingly hit you? like a, a brick wall or yeah, it just much. came on too strong. 
really strong. Uh, I didn't really even like the physical feeling of it particularly, yeah. you know, and it, I, it, I didn't have a clear mind like for, you know, insight or whatever. Um, yeah. So no, just uh, wanted to say that for sure. And so now the question again uh, to move forward was uh, Cliff. Yeah. How do we help educate people? If we have this hip hop culture and these other subcultures that are promoting it as a uh, way just to get uh couch lock to get just so wasted that you can't function mm-hmm. very well how do we give them the fundamentals of this creative tool uh and and, and help them understand that they don't need to smoke these really powerful drugs mm-hmm. i mean these these strains that are uh just so overwhelming to the system yeah, I, I don't actually know. I'm, you know, Terence McKenna once said something like, may the best idea win or the best idea will ultimately win or something like that. Yeah. He also was quoted, I think he borrowed this one and rephrased it, but it was something to the effect of, uh, if the truth can be told in a way that people can understand, it will be believed. So it's just a matter of, um, you know, counter, counter, counter information, really, you know, mm-hmm. and then you know, but people have to come to it. Uh, uh, you, you know, you can't force people to. I, okay, so let, let, let's try this one then. <laughs> um, I used to study with a Buddhist teacher from Tibet, and uh, I'll try to keep this as short as possible. He had a really interesting way of meeting America. Um, he came to the United States uh, originally from Tibet through India through Britain and then on to the United States. Uh, he, his name is Chugim Trungpa. He started an Europa Institute in Colorado and a whole bunch of other educational programs. And his approach was meet them where they are. You know, mm-hmm. uh, don't don't come in and overlay a whole other way of looking at things, you know, heavy handedly or especially humorously, of course, um, uh, meet them where they are. So if there were a way, for example, and I'm just wildly guessing, I've never really had these thoughts particularly before. Um, if there were a way, for example, to get people to talk about this kind of stuff or even do it through music or other forms of art at festivals or concerts or whatever, uh, you know, so that people who wouldn't go looking for books on spirituality or the spiritual use of plants, etc., would uh, encounter it. That's just a wild thought. Yeah, I. Um, it's so funny. Uh, when I was visiting the local dispensary in, in Northern California, there's one in almost in every <laughs> couple of miles. It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. It's great, though, because the variety is fantastic. But I look at the uh, the offering at, at this one place I went to is, was in Berkeley. And there are so many uh, varieties. And they, they talk about the flavor and the uh, what else? Uh, other details. But they're getting to the point now where actually on the actual packaging, they're saying this is good for creative creativeness this is good for uh you know uh relaxation this is good for specific types of uh uh uh, duties you know things you need to do and i think that's the beginning pepper wouldn't you say of identifying specific strains for specific purposes so there's so much to be said here (laughs) Um, first off, yes, terpenes, cannabinoids, flavonoids, that combination is what is going to help a person experience whatever altered state they want to achieve. When companies are placing on their labels, as you said, Cliff, I haven't seen this, but as you said, that these particular terpenes help with creativity, so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, that's really dangerous because Mm -hmm. not all terpenes affect people the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, As right before this conversation, I was on another and it's like having, being a mixologist, you're not certain exactly how that's going to affect the body. Thus a person needs a cannabis therapy consultant. They need a uh, person, a primary care (laughs) who's well-versed in cannabinoids and terpenes and the combination that works within the body. Now, across the board, most terpenes, you're going to find terpenes 
and the plant kingdom everywhere. So if certain terpenes like linalool, for example, it's in lavender, if that affects you in a very calming, relaxing way, the pro- if there's a possibility that that in an organic, full sun, cannabis, clean product will also affect you that same way. Mm-hmm. But I can see that being dangerous for the company to label it in that way. Mm-hmm. There's so many other things. Um, and I'm glad they're getting there. Mm-hmm. What we really want to be looking at is the COA, which is the certification of analysis, to see what that cultivar, what that plant really is. Because as we know, we've talked about this clip before, that people can label a plant anything they want. Say headband is selling. Um, So they're going to label it headband. Well, it may not affect the human in the way that they had hoped for because it's not truly the cult of our headband. So Mm. really what we need to be looking for is going much deeper and going into that level of looking for, is it organic? What is actually in this that's going to affect me in what way? And then we dive into microdosing. Mm. Every little thing, and I'm sorry, Stephen, when you were telling your story, I giggled a little bit um, (laughs) and and I didn't mean to, but it just came out. You're, you're, You're funny in the way that you tell your story in that moment and microdosing is always the direction that you want to go, whether or not the COA and the cultivar and your nose, which is the number one way to tell if cannabis works for you, you can smell it. Your Mm -hmm. nose will never lie. If it's too gassy, it's pro and you don't like gassy. It's probably not going to work for you. Mm -hmm. If you enjoy fruity and the cannabis, the flower itself smells fruity, then it probably will. So always follow your nose and the COA and do your research on fingerprint, but then microdose. Start with mm. very, very small amounts, no matter if it's a tincture, if it's an edible, or if it's a flower, or if it's a vape pen. Right. Yeah, Pepper, real true. quickly on that point about uh, terpenes and uh, mislabeling packaging uh, on cannabis products, has there been any studies done where they say uh, because it has this quantity of terpenes or uh, attributes in the compounds of cannabis. This is a typical reaction people have, which would be higher creativity, maybe more clarity as a writer, as a painter, as a musician. Uh, and this is why we're going to label it. Or are you basically saying that there isn't a, a, a verifiable body of experts or a scientific lab that can actually tell a, a, a grower uh, or a company that yes, this has been tested by this many people and this is the results they get. I just sense? don't think that we're there yet. It's not okay. federal legal. That means that across the board, you can put anything on your product label that you want to. So I just don't think that that's a safe way mm-hmm. um, as a con- consultant to really dial in what product works best for you. With that being said, There are decades of research done on terpenes in the plant kingdom. So we know which terpenes botanically work with the nervous system, with the endocrine system, so on and so on. So we can take that knowledge and that education and bring it over. But for right now, there being a certified federal um, overall research done on cannabis and its terpenes, it, it still varies. So I don't, I'm sure there are lots that have, have done that. And maybe even by the time this airs, there will have been more. Uh, but I'm just, I'm just wanting people to be very cautious that the labels can't always believe a label. Right. Yeah. Okay. May, I, may I add to that? Sure. Of course. of course. Thanks. Yeah. So first of all, you can giggle anytime I speak, please. You, you know, <laughs> <right ahead>. yeah. <laughs> um, secondly, uh, excuse me, um, two things about that. One is uh, I, I found out about this guy named David Krantz. Have you ever heard of him, Pepper? David Krantz? He does genetic testing. 
Um, and uh, he's really looked into how cannabis affects people because of their individual genetic makeup. So I did his testing thing. It was like 250 bucks. You do a swab and you send it off. And, you know, he sends it to a lab and all that. And they do this profile. And because people are, you know, so this is this is related to the this labeling issue. And there's another thing I want to say about the labeling in a moment. But first of all, um, everybody um, has a different genetic makeup and therefore processes uh, cannabis as well as other things. Like he mentioned a different medicine that he took for something. I forget what it was or what the purpose was, but he took it, worked for him. His wife took it, did the opposite, had the opposite effect because she has a different genetic uh, configuration or profile. So it, it's really hard to come up with any kind of a one-size-fits-all anyway, right? And then as far as what you're saying, Pepper, about labeling, uh, I want to reference Mark Blumenthal. I forget the name of the organization. We had him speak at our conference three or four years ago. He uh, runs a, a nonprofit that uh, examines the um, veracity of uh, claims on uh, health, uh, supplements and things like that, vitamins and things that you get in a health food store or whatever. And he said there's a rampant amount of um, untrue labeling, like that they don't have what they claim they have in them. So, yeah, somebody who's producing cannabis, uh, especially a larger company, I would think, on average, but who knows, um, they can say anything. <laughs> and like they might be sitting there if they're not, you know, the most ethical or careful person in the world, they they might be thinking like, who's ever going to check on that, right? Yeah. Um, so there's two, two, two main things there. One is that there is no one size fits all, period. Um, and the other one is that God knows, you know, what was the source of the information that made it to that label. So one of the one of the areas uh, that I have discovered, it's funny because I was thinking about this the other day. When I was in in uh, high school, the 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 pot that we had back then was so bad that <laughs> you literally could take your toilet paper roll a big joint, smoke it halfway. And maybe feel a little something, hmm. but I I, uh, I joke because uh, uh, you know it used to be well. What's good weed? Well, it's when you get a bag an ounce that doesn't have seeds and twigs in it, <laughs> and it has plant matter. You know, it has flower matter. And uh, today, oh my God, it, it's just night and day. Mm -hmm. I, I think the point I'm trying to make is that is very very important, and I want to hear from both of you on this to set an intention before you use these plant medicines. And I have, you know, in this new phase, when I say phase, this is as a, an older adult compared to when I was younger. First of all, the, the, the plants are of such high quality, we, and we just talked about the THC, but they're also just not only stronger, they're, they're more physically effective than, than the stuff we used to smoke. But mm -hmm. what do you say, uh, Pepper, on using intention? How how important is the in intention before you begin your uh, your journey or your ceremony, if you want to call it that? Well, Cliff, I think that intention is important for anything in life. Um, how you're going to use your day, how you're going to communicate, what you're going to consume how you're going to use your body. I think it's just incredibly important. So when consuming cannabis, a plant medicine that is helping you get to an altered state, it's very important to be conscious, to set intention, especially if it's your first time um, or if you're not used to it. And that's really the listeners who are coming online to cannabis. They're very new to this. Mm -hmm. This isn't the cannabis connoisseur who has been doing it for, you know, generations who know their particular cultivar. Mm -hmm. So if you're coming online new to this, setting intention of what you want to happen, why you're using it. And, and, and Cliff, you and I have had this conversation before, the, sh the shamanic journey with cannabis. Yeah. There are a couple of cultivars that I think just really put you in that place. Mm -hmm. uh, Northern Lights being one of them and the, any of the whites, really the white widow, white runs, mm -hmm. those kind of, they really bring you into a place of consciousness. And again, micro dosing those slowly 
but setting intention beforehand. And that can be, you didn't ask this, but I'll share these little tips that I share with my clients and cannabis patients is one, choose a day that you're not going to be asked to do other things, whether it's you asking yourself or being asked outside of yourself to complete a particular task. So for me, that's maybe a Sunday or something. Other people can choose their date. Second, choose a cannabis that smells good to you, setting intention with it, meaning surrounding yourself with all of the things that you may want to do for that particular hour of activity, reading a book, knitting, whatever it is that you choose to do. But those are all pieces of setting intention. And then further than that, you could go into the spirituality of the plant asking to see a certain thing, to understand a certain thing, to unwind a certain thing. I use cannabis, especially that um, a couple different cultivars in ceremonial ways on Sundays, my Sunday cannabis teas to just get answers and understand what my next step in my journey was. Um, And that may sound really out there. But if you think about that, we're doing that all of the time (laughs) with everything. But now we just have a boundary set around us. We're really putting full, clear intention in doing it in such an amazing way that our ancestors have always done it. So that would be my answer there. Yeah. uh, And I, and I thank you for that. Uh, You're right. It is uh, a lot of people do intention and I, you're, I do intend on certain outcomes throughout the day and throughout the week. So you're right. You can cross over into a lot of other areas, but Stephen, it seems to me that, and I've mentioned this before to Pepper, but when you set an intention, it's kind of like you're at you're you're using a software to to program or to move the master mind or brain or higher self to to oversee the experience you're about to have. What do you say about intention? Well, first of all, I thought that was a excellent um, little monologue just then, and I don't know that I have too much to add to that that could improve upon it in any way. Um, uh, however, I could say a couple of things, but I also want to you know, take one of my little tangents for a second, if I may, and that is in regard to what you were saying about you know, the crappy weed from your youth. Um, uh, I don't know if it was sort of particular to the local area where I grew up in southern Ontario in Canada, but we, were, we had access to hashish more than flour. Um, the flower was mostly pretty bad, although occasionally we got something like Colombian, which wasn't bad at all. Uh, but we were getting Lebanese and Afghani and stuff, hash. Jesus, right? you had a great supplier, my friend. Well, we had some uh, Hell's Angels type guys. There was a, oh. I don't want to take too much time here, but there was a, there was a, a quote unquote college in Toronto called Rochdale College. Um, and it was um, an excuse for, um, a, you know, de- uh, dealing, um, you know, hash, you know. So friends of mine, I lived about 20 miles from Toronto. Friends of mine would go into Toronto and pick up, uh, uh, you know, a pound of hash, you know, sort of a block wow. of hash. So, so we were getting pretty high on that. Um, and also, um, uh, Dr. Lester Grinspoon, do you know who he, who he is? He, he wrote a couple of seminal books, um, maybe 20 years ago, like, uh, something about cannabis, you know, re-envisioned or reconsidered or something like that. Mm-hmm. And he said this, it's kind of a red herring, this notion of potency, because he said most sensible human beings know how high they want to get, you know, so Pepper talked about the brand new person and you want to be really, really careful with these strong things today, of course, right. but people like myself who are used to the, you know, who know, you know, the effects of the plant, um, you, you type trait based on the you know the stuff you're dealing with so if if you uh, if you know once you've had smoked that particular um batch or whatever you know that you know half a half of a toke is going to get you pretty high and so if that's how high you want to get that's how much you smoke so right. maybe you had to smoke five or six tokes you know you know back in 1970 compared to the one now but in those days, we just kept smoking until we got that high anyway, right? So uh, that's a little bit of a red herring. So coming back <laughs> to the uh, intention issue, uh, I was thinking while Pepper was speaking that 
there's sort of gradations of intention. That's one thing. One is um, the specific intentions, which I thought you um, explained beautifully, uh, Pepper, um, you know, for different uses and so on. Uh, and then there's a general intention, uh, which, uh, which is more about creating a space. And you also spoke about that. So that's why I don't feel like I have too much to add. Uh, but um, I will say that my focus, as you know, Cliff, has been more toward the quote-unquote um, meditation, spiritual kind of use of cannabis, because that, I think, is the one area that's the least understood and least addressed for most people. Um, there's certainly lots of understanding about how to use cannabis for creativity and exploration of certain you know, thought processes and very, very different things like that. But the sort of um, what some people sometimes call the great open secret of life altogether is that uh, when we can empty our minds of this sort of busyness of thought, uh, then the spiritual world, if you will, opens up potentially. Uh, we sort of surrender into uh, what my old Buddhist teacher called what is, rather than our conceptions of what is and our whole story about what is. So uh, cannabis being a non-specific gracious amplifier can also deepen that process. Um, so if your intention is to do that, uh, then it's not so much a um, it, there's a little bit of a generality to that intention. It's basically saying, I would like to um, uh, work toward or practice opening up to this space that's actually just universal reality. And uh, so it's, it's, and what cannabis can do again is, you know, deepen that potential space. And so you want to, as Pepper said, you know, create a non distractive situation, uh, you know, day, uh, day or evening where you're not going to be bothered. And, and uh, just make that intention that you're going to stay with it too. That's another thing, you know, like that, you know, because cannabis as a, as a non-specific amplifier, it'll it'll make anything seem exciting. You know, yeah. going to get it, you know, going into the kitchen to you know eat, <laughs> for example, right? Or oh, I must do, you know, I oh, I, I really wanted to hear that song, or I really wanted to do this or this. It all gets kind of potentially blown out of perspective as being like, <laughs> as my friend yeah. Neil says, uh, cannabis puts a shine on things, right? Um, so uh, it does. It can take some discipline, some commitment to sit. Like, basically, I use cannabis, as I say, typically twice a week. One is playing music with my friend, but we make it into a kind of a ceremony light as well. We start with a gong, we sit in silence for a bit, we do some prayers and dedications, have like one or two tokes, you know, stronger stuff, but not these concentrates or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and then we sit in silence with that, like meet the plant. And one night I was sitting with her and she said, I think I'll say she, I don't know, or to my own mind, whatever, said, uh, um, uh, start with emptiness or enter empty, so to speak. You know, mm -hmm. when you first have that toke, um, just sit with it. Like, don't do anything right away, especially. Um, so we, we sit for five minutes or so, 10 sometimes, and then we play music for 45 minutes or so and then sort of repeat that process. And the other time in the week, um, I just get up my meditation bench and a little wee gong, um, you know, and a few other things and have water handy and uh, stuff like that. And uh, I hit, you know, and I take a, a hunk of sage and I smudge my space and say, no lower beings allowed in here. <laughs> Only higher beings. <laughs> um, and uh, Why, Is that because you, you've had uh, experiences where, say, uh, problematic uh, entities have been around you or what? What does that mean? No, boy, that's a whole, you know, that's a kind of a hot button one, isn't it, um, for some people? Some people, uh, yeah. Well, that's where it um, can be dangerous for people, this plant, because of that nonspecific amplifier effect, right? Yeah. If you're on the edge, uh, you know, if you're leaning toward, you know, there's some research, you probably know about this, Pepper, that uh, indicates that while not causing schizophrenia, cannabis can hasten the onset of it in vulnerable populations, young people in particular oftentimes, um, you know, because you can get way into your head, right? And things can seem way more serious and way more dramatic and way more horrible and all that. Yeah. I personally have never had any kind of experience like that. I just don't think I'm susceptible to it. Uh, you know, m my only enemy is my own mind. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, uh, but... 
so that's part of the practice, right? So that's the par- that part of the practice of meditation, uh, the kind of meditation I'm referring to here, which in you know, Tibetan Buddhism they call shamatha meditation, just silent, sit down, shut up, and pay attention, basically. Follow your breath. Thoughts come up, you just recognize them. Oh, there you are, you know, no judgment, no, pl- no praise, no blame, as they say. Let that thought go. Come back to being present. So, um, uh, but the thought that comes up, again, might be exacerbated or exaggerated out of perspective by cannabis. So you have to have enough wherewithal or awareness, I think, to go, oh, yeah, that's just a thought in this moment, yeah, right? So exactly. don't, don't let it get you. Um, let just... Yeah. Relax, breathe, breathe, breath, breath. They always say breath. <laughs> breath is your guru, right? Breath yeah. is the savior. Yeah. Uh, those of you who are listening uh, and have heard us talk about cannabis, Pepper mentioned it. Stephen mentioned it. When you're new to this experience, this wonderful plant helper, plant uh, medicine, microdosing your first few times is really, really important, and that's a small hit from a joint a small inhalation from a bong or a vape pen or whatever, not a vape pen, but a vape of some kind. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's critical to start very, very uh, basic and just get a sense of how the feeling comes through you and let it sit for 20 minutes or more. And then uh, after one or two sessions, then consider having a little more. But for me, I'm hypersensitive. I just need a good hit or two and i and i'm and i'm unlike you steve and i i uh, have my sacred sundays i call them where i kind of uh, look at the week and what happens uh, and then i have a, a midweek wednesday usually or thursday where i uh, also am assessing but also looking at what creativity has been going on and and uh, looking for enhancements we're going to take a short commercial break and we will return with our Panel discussion on the future of cannabis. We'll be right back. Now at Mickey D's, when you buy any crispy chicken sandwich or quarter pounder with cheese, you'll get a free medium fry and free medium drink when you order on the app. So do you have the app? How are you going to get this deal if you don't have the app? I know you have a phone. Anywho, if you have the app, enjoy your free fries and drink. If you don't, you can't see me, but know that I'm shaking my head. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Limited time only. I participate in McDonald's. Valid one time per day. Visit McDonald's app for details. Download and registration required. Oh, we could, we could fly. This is your summer. That means Six Flags in the taste of an ice cold Coca Cola. We're talking thrilling coasters, delicious burgers, yes. real moments together, and this. Coke is summer refreshment when you need it most, so you can hop on another ride or race down a slide at the water park. Six Flags and Coca Cola. Come make it yours. Visit SixFlags.com slash Coke to save up to $20 on passes, plus daily tickets starting at $34.99. How should you plan for when your home becomes too small? Or when the next one gets too big? At Sandy Spring Bank, we're here to help create personalized solutions for financing your home loan. Whether it's a new home or refinance, renovation or addition, fixer-upper or new build. Banking is a conversation. Let's talk about your mortgage. Visit sandyspringbank.com slash mortgage. Mortgage, home equity, and other credit products offered by Sandy Spring Bank, equal housing lender. My guests today are Dr. Pepper Hernandez and Stephen Gray, who both are heavily involved in the cannabis marijuana movement. And uh, Stephen is coming to us from Canada, and Dr. Pepper Hernandez is in Oklahoma, United States. And we are discussing the next phase, the next approach to a global citizenship using and applying cannabis in their lives. Pepper, look, talk a little bit about the importance of, um, uh, even though we have talked about this, about microdosing. 
Well, I think the importance of microdosing is is pretty broad. <laughs> I mean, there's so many wonderful pieces of that. The first thing that comes to mind is when we're microdosing anything, uh, but in this conversation, cannabis, we can find the cultivars that work best with our body types. So with that being said, we can almost avoid those interactions that we do not want to have, those particular experiences that may disconnect us from cannabis usage. We have to remember that cannabis is a plant and when it's placed in tincture form or an edible form, it has been concentrated. That process can then also be altered with butane, with isopropyl alcohol. There are all sorts of chemicals that are needed to extract cannabis to have those forms. So if you've never done cannabis before and you choose to do a concentrate, oh no, you could have an experience mm-hmm. that could be well out of the wheelhouse that you may have (laughs) failed with to understand, comprehend, and process. And you may stay away from cannabis altogether. This happens quite often, people contacting me and wanting to know how to go about using cannabis, especially as new users. And Stephen, you had mentioned something about the, um, I think it was like hash that, that was inside of the, the maybe the joint or the, the joint yeah then, yeah the infused also, pre-rolls and then yeah. also dipped and i had a cannabis medical patient from a legal state contact me two weeks ago and they sent me pictures of a joint that had been dipped in diamonds diamonds are an extraction of thc high content they asked if that was okay to microdose. Never had tried cannabis before. Oh and my God. Yeah. Luckily, the product was a good product. The company was clean. They were organic. Um, they were using, they were doing um, raw rosin, raw resin, fresh, you know, flash frozen ice water, hash, all the good stuff that I consider to be clean. But still, if this person would have, had a few puffs or smoked it like they seen other people smoke or if they were with someone who was more of a connoisseur and was like oh smoke half of that they would have had a completely different experience than i had been prepping them to have for a very long time they weren't going to maybe have that relaxed release from anxiety, they yeah. may have had the opposite reaction. Absolutely. So that's yeah. again microdosing anything. And if you're new to the, you know, new to the cannabis world, start with flour and then build yourself up. Tincture, typically an MCT coconut oil is great. Then moving on to these other more concentrated forms, but the concentrates are really for people who know what they're doing, who have yeah. smoked before, who can breathe through the process and mm-hmm. can journal through the process even, or can has d- had a connection with cannabis in that altered state that they know this too shall pass. It's an ebb and flow. It right. will it will, it will be okay in an hour. If you don't have those type of experiences to fall back on with cannabis, you need to microdose mm-hmm. because you will not be able to build a relationship with her. Yeah. Exactly. It's very important. Yeah. And my doctor, by the way, my family doctor says he hates cannabis or really doesn't like it. And I said, why? He said, because the only people I ever see are the ones who show up uh, in a straight state of great distress, you know, so bad trips, from yeah. that very kind of thing that you're just talking about, Pepper, you know, that they have too much and it can be from, it can be from any form of it. And, and in fact, it won't be okay in an hour if you've taken an uh, way too much, uh, you know, brownie or, you know, other edible, um, because that can last four or five, six hours. You know, I had a f- 
friend that um, uh, two friends and one of them was a non essentially a non smoker and they grew a plant and um, uh, it was just like a weak <laughs> kind of plant and they took the leaves like not the not the buds you know they took the leaves and they made them into a brownie and they thought oh this will be like really weak it's just the leaf right it's just because stuff that people sometimes <laughs> throw away. So they made these brownies, and then they made the classic mistake, which you two guys, you two folks have heard of a lot. It's almost a cliche now. Of um, they Like 45 minutes later, they go, do you feel anything? Nah. Do you? Nah. Let's have another one. <laughs> oh, my God. And so the one yeah. guy, Bruce, you know, he was the... Uh, the newbie, so to speak, he really didn't, I mean, I don't know, maybe only spoke pot, you know, a handful of times in his life, and he's now in his 50s or something, right? Um, this is like in the evening, five o'clock in the morning, Bruce is laying in the ceiling, seeing hallucinations, I mean, <laughs> lying in his bed, seeing hallucinations on the ceiling, going, when is this going to end, right? Wow. So if he wasn't with Donnie, who was the experienced one, he prob he may have called 911, which is what people do, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Amazing. that's really important to consider. If I may say so, I, my the, the way I express in the book, it's just one way of talking about it. Um, it doesn't always have to be microdosing, depending on your, as you say, Pepper, um, experience and intention. Uh, my my way of talking about it is to say that the optimal dose is the dose that you both want to and can handle. Um, so hand, can handle to me means that you can. You can do what you were talking about, Pepper. You can stay calm. You can be aware of your breath. You're not going to get thrown off completely. Um, you know, whatever comes up, you can deal with it. You can stay present and let yourself go deeper. If you're having anxiety, and actually, I'm sure you know you've encountered this, Pepper, more than I have in your in your work. But I I, I occasionally run or lead cannabis ceremonies, and um, uh, so what I see occasionally, not very often, but is that um, uh, people have physical reactions if they've smoked more than they can spiritually handle, so to speak. Um, so they'll be dizzy or nauseous or that mm -hmm. kind of thing. You know, they'll feel kind of sick. And I think that is a physical uh, off, offset, so to speak, of not not being able to process it. It's not that the yeah. plant itself, like physiologically, biochemically, is doing that. It's that it wants to which is a whole other thing and you know kind of i know this is your intention to talk about too uh, cliff is i see cannabis as potentially a reality medicine that it, it wants you to be real it wants you to be honest with yourself um wants you to connect more deeply and that's a, a shake-up to the status quo oftentimes to the ego right mm -hmm. and so that can freak you out just in itself and so that as i say can turn into a physical symptom yeah, I want to just mention uh, edibles for uh, novices are you should stay away. It's just there's just too many problems that I hear about, mm -hmm. and people uh, email me. Uh, they thought they were fine, and they did exactly what you talked about, Stephen. They they had a bite of a piece of candy, or they had a gummy, uh, and all of a sudden they did, they didn't feel anything, and then half an hour later they have another or two, and then mm -hmm. wham, yeah, they are freaking out yeah, and they are so stoned. They can't get out of their couch yeah. or they call nine one one or they call nine one one. And, and I, I'd love to see the uh, survey or the, uh, the statistics of people who come in who have eaten a, a gummy or eaten a, an edible over those who could uh, maybe perhaps overdo yeah. it with a, a, a flower mm -hmm. uh, concoction. So, yeah. because those just, it's just a different kind of, uh, uh, of a high, you know, yeah. and and I'm not a big advocate of, of edibles, but a lot of people, they swear by them. So, well, I think uh, traditionally, like in places like India um, uh, and some of the Asian countries, historically, they've used edibles for deep uh, meditation and so on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that does happen. And by the way, for people that are not familiar with that effect um it in my experience pepper you may have uh, some different experience with that but in my experience if you've eaten relatively recently it can take up to two hours for an edible to take full effect <laughs> oh jesus yeah. yeah not great you've we lost your volume i think pepper oh i just i mute oh. myself when yeah. i <laughs> <laughs> i'm not being asked the question because they tend to have a lot of commentary oh. um so my little piece there is I think 
you know, historically using cannabis, they would use it without processing as much as what has been happening nowadays for people who are going into dispensaries and purchasing edibles to consume. Those, we have no idea the cultivar. We have no idea the processing. There are few, very few companies that will show you their processing method. So now we're, we're coming against all of those where I think, you know, hundreds of years ago when cannabis was being used just by ancient peoples in medicine, we're talking more like teas. They were using it such as bang or just oh, having yeah. it as, you know, maintenance dosages, mm -hmm. not the type of edibles that we have now. And the people who need to be even more concerned with edibles are those people who have issues with their endocrine system or have a, you know, um, don't have their gallbladder any longer. It's because they will consume edibles thinking that they're okay. Well, then they may not be able to feel the effects because they don't have a gallbladder. And uh. they'll over consume which can then cause major issues. And these people who are just kind of doing this without any type of guidance, we are seeing, we've been seeing this for like eight years, more and more people who are over consuming have or have been diagnosed with cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. And we can get into that. That's a whole other topic. But what is that? Is that overconsumption of cannabis? Has your cannabinoids been oversaturated or is it the production method in those cannabis delivery into the body? So there's a lot more there. What's, what's going to happen to somebody who doesn't have their gallbladder? It's going to be a delayed reaction or none. They, there is a, a very large possibility. I would say nine out of 10 um, clients who I come across who do not no longer have their gallbladder. They can consume a very large amount of edibles with little to no effect. Interesting. Okay. because it is not being digested. Now it's still being processed through the rest of the intestinal tract. So they're getting a little bit of feeling from it, but nothing like someone who has all of their digestive organs and endocrine system with in intact. Hmm. Um, that's a completely different experience. So you could be hmm. getting knowledge from someone who no longer has one of those particular organs and they're like, Oh yeah, take four. And yeah. it, oh, Jesus. it's like, Oh my gosh. So it, it, every person is so incredibly different yeah. and there is so much medical research and there are people, there are practitioners, there are therapists who are doing this on a daily basis mm -hmm. that have so much to share. Hmm. Fascinating. I want to shift uh, as we come to the conclusion, uh, I want to shift to the spiritual side of of cannabis and my native american friends that i speak to about using uh not only psychedelics but using cannabis related uh products in ceremony talk about the plant ally or the intelligence of of the plant and i have had sessions where it seems like i've been i, I have little hints and, and little suggestions during the altered se session, and I'm just wondering, uh, Stephen, we'll start with you. What do you believe, and you've written about this, mm -hmm. uh, what is your feeling of a, an intelligence behind using this uh, sacred plant? Hmm, boy, that's a tough one. Um, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a lughead in terms of, um, like, I wouldn't say that I've, I think some people have actually claim that they've encountered an identifiable entity, certainly uh, like a spirit entity. Uh, certainly that happens with uh, other psychedelics. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah um, usually for me, it's about getting, just receiving insights in that sense, you know. So I, I don't really know the source in that sense, but oftentimes the insights... Um, make sense you know they sometimes talk about oh you think it's a great insight and then they wake up the next day and it seems stupid or nonsensical or whatever or trivial and that happens too but um 
but you 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 can choose you can pick and choose sort of so to speak you know as long as you don't take it too seriously all the time when it's happening um you can you can you know reflect on those and find out which ones uh, sort of you know pick out the wheat from the chaff the next day or right. whatever right um for me uh it's more sensing a kind presence than anything that's sort of obviously palpable in that say way you know um you know, I know people, like I know a woman, an ayahuasca, she's an ayahuasca ceremony leader, ayahuascara, uh, she's an extremely tuned in, sensitive person. Um, she says that on ayahuasca, she has encountered different saints and so on, you know, a hierarchy of angels and stuff like that, like actually encountered these beings. And the right. Santo Daimi people say a lot of those kind of things happen too, where the like the um, lineage saints will show up, you know, they'll actually come and be there. So I think some people, and maybe Pepper, you've had that experience or some of your clients, but I think some people have those experience. I don't, experiences, I don't have them in that, you know, so such a direct way for me. It's feeling, when things are working, when it's the best, feeling like I'm in a holy presence of some kind, um, not like an individual presence, just an atmosphere and that sense you know uh, it, where it just feels like yeah i mean you know words are tricky holy sacred whatever that is you know but is it like somebody's there kind of watching over you or mm, just no. part of your experience i feel like i'm in the in the temple or something you know like a in sacred a temple a sacred place or it feels that way you know like it's light it's got light it's got love you know that sort of thing those are the optimal ones i don't that doesn't happen all the time by any means you know um mm. but but for those by the way I, I i rarely do edibles myself um it's it's smoking but i do smoke some fairly strong stuff and i will do kind of what you were doing you know i'll have like one toke to start sit with it for a while <clears throat> yeah. and then and then I'll go, okay, I'm feeling pretty comfortable. Let's go deeper. So I think you can go really deep if you can handle it. And that's where that sort of temple opens up more, in my experience anyway, is when you mm -hmm. go, when you do go deeper. Um, yeah, I mean, at the microdose level for, you know, someone who has that kind of experience like myself and others is more about um, calming and allowing yourself to sink into presence a bit more, you know, just mm. being present a bit more and appreciating, you know, what's around you or whatever, you know, walking in the garden and going, wow, my God, flowers are incredibly beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that bee. <laughs> Isn't he wonderful? <laughs> That's so funny. Everything is amplified. You're right. Yeah. And I love the, the opening the term you use, amplification. Yeah. Um, Pepper, isn't, would you say if we use our intention and say, I'd like to have more knowledge of my guidance of my uh, spiritual allies of my plant allies that that would open it up. But I mean, I'm just interested in what your feeling is about uh, plant allies or the intelligence of this sacred plant. Well, so many things come to mind here. When you talk about plant allies, I'm really talking about here on our home planet, not even going outside the celestial world. Our oh home, yeah. The cannabis plant there are many allies within the, can uh, the plant kingdom, like alfalfa, white clover, marigold, all of these work really closely with cannabis. So when you say plant allies, that's what I'm thinking of in that sense, that cannabis works very well. Um, and, and that's just a, a very small list. There are plenty of others that work as more of companion plants within the garden. For connecting I personally use cannabis every single day. Um, I, that's just the way I go about my life, and it's for maintenance. So I specialize in non-psychoactive cannabis um, because I personally get along with a very small amount of THC, but because I have to have cannabis in my daily routine and activity, there's just no way I could function, high-level functioning on THC. I'm not... Um, even though I've used it for as long as I can remember, I, I'm still not working well with high THC cultivars. So with that being said, I don't necessarily, this is a little peek into my world, I don't necessarily need to have a psychoactive experience in order to tap in to some of these 
things that um, Stephen was speaking on, or even Cliff, you speak on or interview people on, it is just a normal part of my reality. I am a Pisces. I came in very (laughs) tuned in, um, as I would say, with a lot of different worlds. I come from a very long lineage of background of healers on both sides. I do not consider myself a healer, uh, but on both sides of my family chain. And I think that everyone coming on to the planet currently, we all have something to give and to share. So with that being said, I tap into those type of realities on a daily basis. It, I do not need to have any plant medicine to get myself there. So if I'm going into the garden and seeing something, I'm seeing it in full oh, view. Of, interesting. Oh, whoa, this is incredible. Or I can sit in, you know, I, you may know, um, Cliff, I'm sure I've mentioned this before, two hours of, of meditation daily. I can drop in very quickly and get contact with any spiritual guides or, or connection that I need to very quickly. Now, this doesn't happen for everyone. And I do think plant medicine, especially cannabis, is a very gentle way to start yes. to- experience and open that I know for myself that I would be completely blown open if I were to engage in any other molecules that would take a normal human neurodivergent into those realms it would be too much for me because I'm already so incredibly sensitive Mm. right yeah interesting I I'd like to rephrase the term perhaps plant ally to the term that's more widely used, which is muse. And I use the word muse as a writer and a highly a creative person. I have actually sought the muse when I had a problem in trying to complete a chapter and, and so forth. And I'll take a very small microdose of cannabis with the intention of connecting with my muse. And during the session, I'll get little hints about sentence structure, not specific because I'm not in any state to get into details, but I'll get hints from what I, I can consider my muse to, to actually either polish a, a paragraph or a chapter or polish an article that I'm writing using some specific language that I would not have been able to access in any other setting. And so when I say plant ally, I'm also using, I, ca- I, ca- I only can consider it as a muse or helper guidance mm-hmm. from whatever level. Uh, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, makes sense to me. I think there's a physiological, biochemical explanation for that too. Um, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know all of it. But um, uh, I know, for example, one guy that writes his whole book. Uh, I mean, this is a really good writer. Um, he, his first book... Um, sold like half a million copies or something. It was, a, it was on LSD and the history of LSD and all that sort of thing. So he's writing nonfiction, which also involves research. But when he writes, he writes high. But when, you know, it's kind of like what, the way Pepper uses cannabis, um, which is, you know, if you're using small amounts daily, then um, what happens is, uh, you know, well, I said, I asked him, I say, you know, why do you write high? I, 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 I can't really write high. I get ideas like you, Cliff, but I prefer to do the actual writing uh, straight, as it were. Um, um, uh, and he said, uh, because it's a vasodilator, it actually um, sharpens the mind in that sense, right? Um, and then in my book, Joan Bellows' chapter, the way she talks about it is she says it balances the both hemispheres of the brain. Um, uh, they call it sometimes homeostatic balance, right? Oh, uh, mm-hmm. And and the effect of that is that uh, when you smoke, as opposed to uh, oral, there's at the beginning there's a some, a little bit of an increase in heart rate. There can be a lot if you eat, take too much, but um, if you have a little bit, then what you're doing is stimulating the uh, an increased flow of um, uh, of, of blood flow of, and, and bringing fresh oxygen into all the extremities, and that includes the brain, right? So it can function in that way. Uh, Neil Young, you know the great singer-songwriter Neil Young? Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to ask those questions now because, <laughs> you know, time has moved on. Like, who are the Beatles? Never heard of them. No, whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, That's true. Yeah, so he wrote most of his beautiful songs back in the 
60s and 70s uh, under the influence. But what he said was, you smoke a little bit, you write a song. You smoke a lot, you're just baked. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, this has been uh, fun to have you both on the program. Let's let's imagine the United States, and of course we can add Canada to this as well, uh, Steve, because that's where you live. <laughs> let's imagine North America. There we go, North America. There you go. Completely legal in a few years. And what does that look like, Pepper? Let's start with you. What does that look like when these growers, these dispensaries, these companies are allowed to promote, to uh, grow, and to distribute cannabis to a, a monstrous uh, audience. Well, I want to just touch base on one quick thing. I did say I was, I want to clarify this, if that's okay, Cliff. I said that I was a daily user. I juice and I use a tincture. And I think it's really interesting that here, just in our little conversation, I'm using cannabis for a completely different reason than maybe some others are using it. I'm using it for maintenance in my nervous system. Right. I'm epileptic. And so I do it on a daily basis to dial my nervous system down and relax myself. Do you juice every day, Pepper? As often as I possibly can. So, oh, I didn't know it was every... Okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, so if you're in locations that have plants during their peak time, you can juice them and then put them in the freezer. Like put them in ice cube trays and then each of those cubes can then go in a Ziploc bag so then you have juice year round. Cool. That's raw juice, right? Raw plant? Yes. Yeah. Yes, raw plants matter because there are cannabinoids and terpenes in different parts of the plant. I do utilize, uh, when I'm at my home grow, I do utilize the stems for tea uh, yeah. when, when that happens. So I'm consuming it in a very plant-based way. Mm -hmm. So for those, of the, those people that were listening, I think that that's important for them to know I'm utilizing it not to achieve that high vibrational frequency, let's get ideas. I'm actually doing the opposite because my body, I'm pitta. And so I'm already on that vibe. I'm already there. And then being Pisces and then being female and then meditating two hours. So I'm already, <laughs> I'm trying to balance out. Um, so I'm, but, but Cliff, your question, can you restate that please for me? So uh, I think, I think the estimate was, and I heard this from a politician that within 36 months, the United States will be completely legal. Uh, federally, uh, uh, people will be allowed to grow, distribute, create businesses. What does that look like? And, I, and not just the United States, North America, that includes Canada as well. Well, we already have federal legalization here. Oh, that's true. That's right. Yeah. Um, okay. But you're not recreational in every uh, uh, state, are you? Uh, it's across the board federally. So as long as I'm talking, I'll answer that one and then pass it back to Pepper, maybe. Um, uh, uh, yes, it's recreational uh, for all adults over the age of 19 or whatever. In, there's 10 provinces and three territories. Uh, they can set some of the rules themselves, but the basics are all adults. 19 or over. Um, so just briefly, though, the, um, Canada is worth studying because they've made some d distinct mistakes, I think, and most people I know would agree with this. Uh, they gave out, to start with, 30 licenses, and they were all to, they call them LPs, licensed producers. They gave them to mostly large publicly traded companies. Bad idea in the most people's view. Um, uh, you know, giant 10,000 square foot factories or whatever the hell, right? Uh. You know, um, uh, and they didn't support, like British Columbia in particular had a really vigorous small grower, you know, in the, now they use this term, right? Legacy, but, uh, you know, just in the you know, previous illegal market, there were little growers all over the province that were, many of them really cared about their plants and they were the ones doing the innovative experimenting with the genetics and all that too, and strains and cultivars, et cetera, et cetera. They all got cut out uh, when legalization came in. I've only been uh, in a legal dispensary three times in five years. 
since they legalized it in Canada. Um, uh, I, you know, I deal with people who uh, are those kind of people, the ones that love their plants. You know, that that's another thing we ne- we haven't got a chance to talk about today and won't, I don't think. But there's there's reason to believe that people who really care about their plants and literally put love and care into their plants produce a better effect in the end. And yeah. I see peppers nodding to, in agreement. Um, uh, so uh, I think they really screwed up in a lot of ways in Canada by focusing on the corporate side of things and 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 being overcautious about the way they did it. So it's still, five years later, really difficult for small craft growers to get into the market. They have to go through this, through this distribution chain, you know. Um, and it's uh, expensive. Like, it's 150000 bucks for a license or something like that. That sounds like you, California. It's yeah, crazy. and then you have to, and beyond that, you have to put in a lot of like um uh safety and uh you know sanitation things and all this kind of i don't know the details but it, it's just not if you have like 50 plants or 100 plants it's just not possible really for most people it's what's just, the uh, limit for individual growth though do you get five six seven plants you can grow legally i think or? it's four which four you know, plants yes <laughs> wow yeah, but you know but think of it uh this is not my situation at all, but uh, Pepper, you would know about this. If you need uh, cannabis, like some people, because of serious conditions, whatever, um, uh, you know, certain, certain kind of chronic conditions that they have, need a lot of cannabis. They need to smoke several times a day just to manage their, their condition, right? Um, you're going to go through that stuff pretty damn quickly. And four plants is not enough for, for a lot of those people. Yeah. Anyway, so yes, if it were if if I were if they were starting over in Canada and I were the benevolent dictator of the country, um, <laughs> I would I would uh, I would say um, <clears throat> you know bring in the people who already have been doing this for forty years for God's sakes you know yeah um, uh, and 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 take advantage of their expertise and let these small growers like small is beautiful with so many things right you know yeah. And, you know, food, all kinds of different things, clothing, many things, you know, like small people who care about what they're doing. Uh, um, You know, it's 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 just a no brainer on some level. Um, You know, it's really hard to find. You know, I know people that they can't they just can't find anything they like in some of these stores, you know, really. I, I guess my main question before we go to Pepper is, are there these big guys that are growing organically? And uh, they're verified organic growers, or is that pretty hard to find? I can't say for a fact, but I don't think the big, the really big ones. We're talking like Tilray, Canopy Growers. Yeah, those uh, guys are not. Those are all commercial uh, ma- soils ma- and additives yeah. and crap Aurora like that. Aurora Cannabis, Canopy Growers. I can see Tilray. Pepper shaking her head. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the big thing is trying to get organic. Uh, okay. Well, that's interesting to know that uh, uh, you're full-blown legal, including recreational, uh, which is – I'm jealous of because I thought you still had a few uh, steps to go before you got to the full legalization. So, Pepper, the question goes again, what does it look like for the United States as a country to be completely legal? Uh, I mean, I already see marketing going crazy and having billboards. We have them right now in California. You have billboards for dispensaries, but specific brands and things like that, that's, you know, we're a marketing country so we would have that billions of dollars spent but what's your feeling on uh the consciousness of uh of uh americans towards a um fully recreational use of uh, cannabis well my feelings are different than my thoughts um my thought is how is this going to go in the u.s And I would say, let's fast forward two years after federal legalization and really then look at it because those first couple years, I don't know if that would be a very comfortable place for a lot of people, not just people as the producers trying to sell their product, but then also the now medical patients looking for cannabis. Uh, That first two years is going to be really interesting And I think just getting that education out to people past that, I would hope, and this is where my feeling comes in, I would hope that we could start educating each and every person who needs cannabis, truly needs cannabis, whether they are 
or have been labeled recreation or medicinal. I I don't care what you're labeled. It's a spectrum of how you use cannabis in my mind. So no matter what that is, educating those people on how to grow organically, craft farm, using it in a sustainable way to really help not only themselves, but their community. That's Mm. what I would like to see. So if we're going down the positive rabbit hole, that's where I would want to communicate about that. Um, I love, and Stephen, may I ask you a question about what they have in Canada? I believe it's called Farm Gate, where people can actually go to the craft cannabis farmer and consume or purchase, maybe not consume on spot, but they can purchase their medicine right there just as if that was a cucumber farmer or a bell pepper farmer or organic produce farmer. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I actually don't know any more about that than you do. I've heard of, I've heard of it, but I don't know how um, prevalent it is at this point. Okay. Um, and those, I think uh, I did hear that th- those people are still not able to um, get their, you know, their product into the marketplace, particularly they can sell it at their gate or whatever, but they're still excluded from the stores, you know? Oh, yeah. that's I terrible. Think that's just, I, mean, I that's think, I think that's now. don't, don't, don't quote me completely on that. I'd have to yeah. double check, but I think I heard that. Yeah. There's I mean, limitations I with that. Yeah. I personally think that that would be amazing. I think even just having access like that where other community members can go and support their craft farmer like they are doing in Canada and different providences where it Mm -hmm. is legal to do that and where people are actually um, engaging in that type of conduct with their community. Mm -hmm. I think that's amazing. And I Mm. see that happening here in the U S that would be Mm. so fabulous. Whether people have to go to that farm particularly Mm. or the farmer can come down to the organic farmers market Mm -hmm. and connect. Now, that's only going to benefit those communities that have access like that. What do we do with what 70% of other communities that are like in dry food, food deserts? I mean, then we can go down a different rabbit hole, but um, I think that may have answered your question on just my thoughts of how that's going to look. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it seems like a no brainer that, you know, there's a Saturday morning farmer's market about four blocks from here. Like, why on earth can't you have a couple of cannabis table booths as well? You know, I mean, it is legal. I don't know what the, I don't know actually what the holdup on something like that is, but that mm. would be a pretty future from my point of view. I would love a farmer's market that had cannabis for sale. <laughs> that yeah. would be great. Straight from our farm to your mind. Yeah. <laughs> in Oklahoma, they're doing it in Humboldt County. There are, are they? cannabis farmers markets where you can go in and purchase your cannabis directly from the farmer and ask uh, about organic sustainability, about their biodynamics, about they, the way they're, if they're doing KNF farming on their farm, there are already places that are doing that. I would just mm-hmm. like to see that knowledge and that connection of this is just like basil. I would love to see that spread through the whole entire U.S., more or less the, mm-hmm. the, the whole world. Uh, I don't know what to say about that. I think that these big corporations, uh, like Stephen's talking about in Canada, are they're paying uh, they're paying a lot of money and they're dominating the market. And I think that's just not only it's not fair, but it's not very diverse. I mean, some smaller growers could be producing really uh, mm-hmm. outstanding uh, uh, quality flour, and they're not allowed to enter the market. That's like. What the hell is going on there? It seems odd. We could talk about this for hours. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, Stephen Gray and Pepper Hernandez, thank you both. Before I let you go, Stephen, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, what's your website? Uh, Stephen Gray, um, uh, Stephen Gray Vision.com. That's S T E P H E N G R A Y, not E Y, like some people spell gray, um, dot com. And I'm also on Facebook as Stephen Gray. Um, and I think that Facebook group is called Stephen Gray, all mushed together, one word, and then vision, separate word. Stephen Gray, word, 
vision word. Um, and I'm sort of on Instagram, but I've been too lazy to do anything much about it. Um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, what, I, and same way. I think there's ways to contact me through Facebook, uh, uh, or the website has contact as well. Um, so yeah, I'm reachable and happy to talk to people if they have sincere questions and so on as well. Um, although I would probably direct them to Pepper because she's the real expert on this stuff. I have to say, though, for those of you listening, uh, we had Stephen on when his uh, book came out, Cannabis and Spirituality. Excellent reference for newbies. Excellent for anybody who is using cannabis or psychedelics. Uh, it's a great, great book. Give us the name of the new book again coming out in November. Uh, the full title and subtitle is How Psychedelics Can Help Thank God the word help is in there, not just without it. Anyway, how psychedelics can help save the world, uh, colon, subtitle, uh, uh, visionary and indigenous voices speak out. There's about four or five indigenous people communi- uh, you know, sharing in that book I love as that. well. Yeah. 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 Looking forward to that. Okay, we'll have you back on that. Okay, Pepper, uh, Dr. Pepper Hernandez, of course, is the website.com, tons of material. Anything else? that you uh, want people to know about? Yeah, you can find me at Dr. Pepper Hernandez across all platforms. That would be TikTok, IG, FB, and on YouTube as well. And then if anyone's interested in being a cannabis therapy consultant, they can check out the Cannabis uh, Holistic Institute dot com. And then there's tons of podcasts out there with content from um, Quantum Alignment, which is my podcast. <laughs> Thank and, you. And, and, and Clubhouse too. We are on Clubhouse every Tuesday. And so people can join that for free. And there are replays. There's over 25 episodes there and Excellent. 55 episodes on uh, quantum alignment. Excellent. And the, the joint discussions podcast, that new podcast as well. So there's okay. plenty of places to find content. Nice. Lots of good material. And I of course, I have uh, a YouTube channel. I forgot to mention. Oh, that. you do. Go ahead. What's the, yeah. uh, what's same the same thing? URL? Stephen Gray, all one word vision. And the purpose uh, primarily is to interview leading figures in psychedelics and consciousness transformation, uh, not cool. just cannabis. Um, all of them. Yeah. I wanted to uh, mention, aren't you putting together another event pretty soon? Uh, in, well, we have our 11th spirit plant medicine conference in Vancouver with a lot of leading figures in, in the field. And when is that again? What's the date? November 4th to 6th in Vancouver, and it's also online, and there's a free and a paid version of online if you can't get to Vancouver. Cool. Um, uh, so the free, the, the only difference is that the paid version gives you more interactivity and a couple of other perks and things like that, but there's lots of ways to participate in that conference, and it's a great one. Honestly, it is. Um, you know, we get lots of leading figures in the, um, in the field, and it's really about, you know, changing the world more than anything. You know, the psychedelics are the tools, so to speak, when yeah. they're used properly. Mm-hmm. It's really about how to help educate people to realize that the, the way that the planet is going is not functional any longer, and we have the capability of changing our consciousness in a way that puts us in touch with reality and helps save the world. <laughs> there you go, my listeners. Those are two thought leaders, uh, influencers. Pepper uh, Hernandez and Stephen uh, Gray are influencers. Thank you both. It's been fun. Uh, we'll have to do this again and uh, uh, see what